In 2005, the tranquility of Angelique Lynn Lavallee's life was shattered when she stood trial for the death of her partner, Kevin Rust. But this isn't your average true crime story. It's a journey through the labyrinth of domestic abuse, survival, and the blurred boundaries of self-defense. As the courtroom drama unfolded, Lavallee's defense thrust the spotlight on the concept of battered woman syndrome, painting a stark picture of a woman driven to the brink by relentless abuse. The prosecution, however, would have none of it, challenging the admissibility of expert testimony and raising eyebrows over the limits of self-defense. This wasn't just a trial. It was a battleground for the very definition of justice. And as the case ascended to the highest echelons of the Canadian legal system, the nation held its breath. In a groundbreaking decision in 2010, the Supreme Court of Canada sent shockwaves through the legal landscape, redefining the parameters of self-defense in the context of domestic abuse. Tonight, we dive into the depths of a narrative which challenges our perceptions, ignites debate, and leaves us questioning the fine line between the definition of victim and perpetrator. Because in the pursuit of justice, some stories are not just cases, they're crucibles which shape the very fabric of our legal system. Greetings everyone, and welcome back to Memento Mori Stories. I'm your host, Ella Favela, and tonight we'll unravel the haunting tale which gripped a nation, the chilling case of Angelique Lynn Lavalle. If you're joining us again, welcome back to the darkness. If you're new here, you're in for a wild ride. If you enjoy coffee and being creative while discussing horror, politics, history, and true crime, you are certainly in the right place. Before we go any further, make sure you've subscribed to our YouTube channel, hit the red button below and ring the bell so you never miss another mystery we'll unravel together. Now, to sweeten the deal, I'm always posting behind the scenes content, reels, shorts, and TikToks, so make sure to follow me on my socials. All of the links are on screen now and they're clickable in the description box below. I'm currently running a contest on my Instagram, be the 250th follower at Memento Mori Art, and you'll win a free painting shipped anywhere in the world with absolutely no strings attached. So don't forget to follow me on my socials, lots of updates and sneak peeks into my life. The Memento Mori community is growing quickly. You're definitely gonna want to join us now for a front row seat. Before we dive deeper into the shadows, I must offer a quick heads up. The following content contains discussions of domestic abuse, violence, and other sensitive themes. If these topics are triggering for you, it's okay to skip this one. Your mental well being comes first. We're here to explore, educate, and inspire. But we understand that our content is heavy and that it might not be for everyone. If you need to step away, please go take care of yourself. Our other episodes cover a wide range of topics. Feel free to explore those instead. Your mental health is my top priority. Please consider yourself warned. Now, for those who are ready to venture into the unknown with us, it's time to grab your paintbrushes, fix yourself a cup of coffee, and get ready to continue our journey into the landmark case of Angelique Lavallee. Born in 1970 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, Angelique Lynn Lavallee navigated a turbulent childhood in a working class family, marked by financial struggles and familial discord. Finding solace in visual art, she used her creations to communicate in a world where her words often fell short. As a teenager, her art became a silent rebellion, a means of coping with the challenges surrounding her. However, her sanctuary wasn't immune to the complexities of her personal life. 
Details about Lavallee's early relationships, obscured by time and guarded by those who knew her, offer only brief glimpses into this turbulent journey. Behind the courtroom drama lies a woman shaped by the intricacies of adolescence, love, and unfortunately, abuse. Angelique's early life is a chronicle of resilience and survival, etched against the canvas of her formative years. As we explore these experiences, we begin to understand the complexities that shaped the woman who stood at the center of a courtroom, challenging the very concept of justice. She would cross paths with Kevin Rust in the late 1980s in Winnipeg. The details of their meeting are not extensively documented, but it likely occurred through local connections or common social circles. Angelique Lynn Lavallee was in a common law relationship with Kevin Brewster Rust for roughly three or four years. Their relationship was characterized by frequent arguments and violence, often spanning extended periods of intense dissatisfaction between the couple. Miss Lavallee endured physical abuse from Mr. Rust, leading to several hospital visits between 1983 and 1986. Injuries included severe bruising, multiple severe contusions, a broken nose, and a black eye. Witnesses, including a friend and an acquaintance, observed Mr. Rust assaulting Miss Lavallee on multiple occasions. On one such instance, a friend saw Miss Lavallee point a gun at Mr. Rust, threatening to shoot him if he touched her again. Suspicions steadily began to arise within her circles as Miss Lavallee would continuously explain injuries as accidents. The night of August 30th, 1986 marked a critical incident. During a party at their residence, Witnesses reported Mr. Rust violently chasing Miss Lavallee outside, where she sought refuge behind a friend. Disturbing sounds of a vicious, harsh argument preceded two gunshots. Miss Lavallee had fired two shots with a rifle, with the second proving fatal, as Mr. Rust walked out of the room before collapsing for one last time, ultimately succumbing to his injuries. In her distressed state, Angelique confessed to the shooting, citing ongoing abuse and fear for her life. During her arrest, she expressed concern for Mr. Rust's well-being, stating he threatened to kill her if she didn't kill him first. Examinations revealed defensive injuries on Miss Lavallee, consistent with her claims of being terrorized. The coroner noted multiple bruises on Mr. Rust's hands, indicative of assault. The legal journey which unfolded after the tragic events of February 6, 2003, were marked by intricate examinations of self-defense, the impact of prolonged abuse, and the challenges faced by individuals attempting to extricate themselves from cycles of domestic violence. Angelique found herself at the center of a complex legal narrative where the thin line between victim and perpetrator seemed to blur against the backdrop of years of emotional turmoil and physical harm. The legal proceedings delved into the intricacies of the battered woman defense, a legal strategy that seeks to contextualize a victim's actions within the broader framework of domestic abuse. The courtroom became the stage for a nuanced exploration of Lavallee's state of mind and the factors which led to the fatal shooting of Kevin Rust. The defense argued that Lavallee's actions were a desperate response to prolonged abuse and to the imminent threat on her life. They relied on expert testimony, including that of a psychiatrist specializing in the treatment of battered wives. This expert witness provided crucial insight into the psychological toll of long-term abuse, explaining how Angelique's experiences had left her feeling vulnerable, worthless, and trapped. The psychiatrist asserted that Lavallee's shooting of Rust was a final desperate act, born of the belief that her life was in immediate danger. 
The courtroom drama unfolded as witnesses recounted the history of abuse within Lavallee and Rust's relationship. Reports of severe physical injuries, hospital visits, and eyewitness accounts of Mr. Rust's violent behavior painted a grim picture of a relationship marked by very real and persistent danger to Angelique's safety. The defense presented these accounts to establish the pattern of abuse which ultimately contributed to Lavallee's state of mind on the night of the shooting. The legal proceedings also scrutinized the night of the event, examining witness testimonies and the circumstances leading up to the fatal shots, the portrayal of Lavallee's emotional distress, the sounds of fiery agitation in the moments preceding the gunshots, and her immediate confession after the incident would become pivotal elements in the courtroom narrative. The legal team emphasized Lavallee's visible injuries and defensive stance as corroborating evidence of the ongoing abuse. Marks and injuries on her body, consistent with defensive action, were noted by both a police officer and a doctor. The coroner who performed the autopsy on Rust had also previously observed bruises on his hands, aligning with the assertion that he had, in fact, seriously assaulted somebody. As the trial progressed, the defense navigated the delicate balance of portraying Lavallee as a victim, while also acknowledging her role in Rust's death. The legal strategy aimed to humanize her, shifting the focus from the fatal act to the years of torment which preceded it. The prosecution, on the other hand, had the challenging task of presenting Lavallee as a perpetrator who had taken a life irrespective of her history of abuse. The legal proceedings thus became a nuanced exploration of justice, raising profound questions about the limits of self-defense and the complexities inherent in cases of prolonged domestic violence. Following the trial, the jury acquitted Miss Lavallee, who did not testify. The Crown appealed to the Manitoba Court of Appeal, who ordered a new trial, expressing concern about the absence of psychiatric evidence and the trial judge's instructions to the jury. The case then reached the Supreme Court of Canada. Madam Justice Bertha Wilson, delivering the unanimous judgment, disagreed with the Court of Appeal and restored the acquittal, recognizing battered wife syndrome as a legitimate defense to the murder of Mr. Rust. Justice Wilson fundamentally adjusted the law of self-defense to accommodate battered women. She challenged the strict application of the imminence rule and highlighted the unique circumstances of a battered spouse. Wilson emphasized the need for expert evidence, such as that presented by the psychiatrist, to help a jury fully comprehend the mental state of a battered woman. Furthermore, she fully rejected the notion of requiring a battered woman to wait until an assault was underway before deeming her apprehension reasonable, stating it would be akin to sentencing her to murder by installment. In addition to the imminence rule, the criminal code mandated the accused to believe on reasonable grounds that it is not possible to otherwise preserve him or herself from death or grievous bodily harm. Wilson's decision reflected a significant shift in modern Canadian legal perspectives, acknowledging the unique challenges faced by battered women in cases of self-defense and recognizing the importance of expert testimony to navigate the complexities of such situations. Madam Justice Wilson reiterated that an average person, including a juror, may question why a battered woman didn't leave her abuser sooner. An expert's role, she argued, is crucial in clarifying that women's hesitancy isn't due to a lack of severity in the abuse or a perverse desire for mistreatment. The expert can shed light on the learned helplessness experienced by battered women, where damaged self-esteem leads to repeated forgiveness in exchange for apologies and expressions of love at the end of each violent cycle. Justice Wilson firmly stated that the jury shouldn't pass judgment on why an accused battered woman stayed in a relationship, 
emphasizing that such decisions do not forfeit the right to self-defense. She urged the jury, after considering all evidence, including expert testimony, to evaluate what a reasonable person would do under those circumstances. In a decisive tone, Justice Wilson likened the battered woman's situation to that of a hostage, highlighting that if, given the history and circumstances, she believes killing her abuser is the only way to preserve herself, it's reasonable to act preemptively in the most extreme manner. She emphasized that the decision doesn't grant a license to kill. Rather, it's the jury's responsibility to determine if the evidence, especially the expert evidence, justifies acquittal. The ruling doesn't broadly extend self-defense in all cases. Rather, it establishes a guiding principle. In Canada, no one has the right to abuse any woman under any circumstances, ever. ever. While Wilson is praised for recognizing women's experiences in contrast to traditional legal views, some suggest applying a similar approach to other criminal law doctrines. There's a call to revisit criminal code defenses like duress or provocation to consider a broader context. However, caution is urged against portraying the battered woman syndrome as a psychological disorder ensuring that women's response to domestic violence isn't seen as abnormal and that the claim of self-defense remains accessible without having to conform to new stereotypes. In retracing the legal proceedings of the Lavallee case, it is evident that the courtroom became a battleground not only for legal arguments, but also for a broader societal reckoning with the complexities of abuse. Lavallee's defense challenged traditional notions of culpability, pushing the legal system to confront the intricacies of domestic violence and the often desperate responses it provokes. As the Lavallee case unfolded, it left an indelible mark on the ongoing discourse surrounding the rights of individuals facing prolonged abuse. The courtroom became a crucible for examining the delicate balance between justice and empathy, highlighting a need for a legal system capable of comprehensively addressing these complexities, which are inherent in cases of domestic violence. The Lavallee case, with all of its legal intricacies and societal resonance, remains a poignant chapter in the ongoing evolution of Canadian legal perspectives on the intersection of abuse, self-defense, and justice. Society's lens on battered women has started very slowly, to undergo a dynamic shift, shaped by changing cultural narratives, evolving legal perspectives, and heightened awareness campaigns. Historically, prevailing attitudes often leaned towards victim blaming, questioning why women subjected to abuse didn't extricate themselves sooner. Such notions, rooted in a lack of understanding about the psychological complexities of such relationships, perpetuate a culture of shame and silence, hindering the discourse around domestic violence. However, contemporary society, led by modern heroes like Justice Wilson, has witnessed a marked shift in how it perceives survivors. This shift is propelled by increased awareness, advocacy initiatives, and legal advancements that acknowledge the profound psychological impact of prolonged abuse. Efforts to dispel myths surrounding domestic violence and to foster empathy for victims have contributed to a more nuanced understanding of the challenges faced by battered women. New legal precedents exemplified by cases like Lavallee have played a pivotal role in challenging societal perceptions. Recognizing the psychological trauma inflicted by prolonged abuse, these legal milestones contribute to dismantling the harmful notion that staying in an abusive relationship is a mere choice rather than a complex response to fear, manipulation, and helplessness. Media, as a powerful influencer, has also contributed to reshaping public views on battered women. 
Increased representation in films, television, and news coverage have exposed audiences to the multifaceted nature of abuse and its aftermath. Authentic portrayals of survivors navigating the challenges of leaving abusive relationships have humanized the experience of battered women, fostering greater understanding and empathy. Additionally, social media allows survivors, such as myself, the freedom to connect with others on a global scale. By leveraging the hundreds of millions of active daily users across platforms, we're able to share our stories worldwide. This, in turn, allows us to build community, raise awareness, and to take the power back from our abusers by normalizing conversations about what happens all too frequently behind closed doors. In the contemporary landscape, there's a growing acknowledgement that the experiences of battered women are diverse and can't be easily pigeonholed. Recognizing the impact of intersectionality adds layers of complexity to the narrative, considering how factors like race, socioeconomic status, and sexual orientation intersect with gender. The need for culturally competent support systems and legal frameworks which address the unique challenges faced by all survivors, irrespective of their background, is increasingly recognized as a crucial aspect of societal progress. The evolving perception of battered women reflects a profound journey from ignorance and victim blaming towards an understanding of the intricate dynamics of abuse and the resilience of survivors. Legal developments, media representation, and advocacy efforts have all contributed to a more empathetic understanding, challenging harmful stereotypes and fostering a climate in which survivors are heard, believed, and supported on their journey to reclaim agency and autonomy. Yet, the ongoing work of challenging entrenched norms and fostering an inclusive understanding of the diverse experiences of battered women still remains a critical endeavor. Negative stereotypes about domestic abuse survivors persist in society, perpetuating harmful misconceptions that not only hinder the healing process, but also contribute to a culture of victim blaming and disbelief. These stereotypes often arise from deep-rooted misconceptions about the nature of abuse and from a lack of understanding of the complex dynamics which survivors face. One prevalent stereotype is the notion that survivors are somehow responsible for the abuse they endure. Victim blaming takes various forms, from questioning why the survivor didn't leave the abusive relationship sooner, to insinuating that their actions or behaviors provoked the abuse. These unfounded assumptions ignore the power dynamics inherent in abusive relationships, where control and manipulation by the abuser often make leaving a dangerous and complicated process. Another harmful stereotype revolves around the idea that survivors are weak or passive individuals who are unable to stand up for themselves. This perception fails to recognize the strength and courage exhibited by survivors who navigate the challenges of leaving an abusive relationship. In reality, survivors display immense bravery in breaking free from the cycle of abuse, facing societal judgment, and rebuilding their lives. The trope of the perfect victim is another damaging stereotype that can affect survivors' credibility. Society expects survivors to fit a certain narrative, often fueled by misconceptions about who can or who should be a victim of domestic abuse. This stereotype excludes individuals who don't conform to these preconceived notions, such as those from diverse backgrounds, genders, or socioeconomic statuses, which reinforces harmful bias and prevents survivors from both sides of the coin from seeking help. The stigma surrounding mental health is yet another obstacle which survivors often face. Negative stereotypes may portray survivors as emotionally unstable or fundamentally broken. 
This misconception not only overlooks the multiple psychological impacts of abuse, but also discourages survivors from seeking the mental health supports which they need and deserve, which ultimately only serves to perpetuate a cycle of silence and suffering. These negative stereotypes collectively contribute to an overall culture of skepticism and disbelief, which makes it difficult for survivors to want to disclose their experiences. A fear of judgment, societal misconceptions, and the perpetuation of these stereotypes create multiple barriers which hinder the healing process and discourage survivors from seeking help. Challenging and dismantling these stereotypes is crucial for creating a more supportive and understanding environment for survivors. By fostering empathy, raising awareness, and promoting education about the diverse experience of domestic abuse survivors, society can contribute to breaking down these harmful stereotypes and can create a more inclusive and compassionate discourse around domestic violence. Supporting survivors of domestic abuse requires a multifaceted and compassionate approach. Firstly, it's crucial to listen without judgment, providing a safe space for survivors to share their experiences. Validation and belief in their stories are powerful tools in overcoming the isolation which often accompanies abuse. Offering practical assistance, such as helping with safety planning or connecting survivors with local support services, can be invaluable. Empower survivors by respecting their autonomy and their choice, recognizing that leaving abuse is a complex process which takes time. Educating yourself about the dynamics of domestic abuse and understanding the diverse experiences of survivors is also essential. This knowledge enables supporters to offer informed and empathetic assistance, dispelling harmful stereotypes and myths surrounding domestic abuse. Encouraging survivors to access professional help, including counseling and legal support, is vital. Provide information about available resources and help them navigate the often overwhelming process of seeking assistance. Respect their decisions. Acknowledging that leaving or staying in an abusive relationship is a deeply personal choice. Lastly, be an ongoing source of support. Domestic abuse recovery is a long journey and maintaining a consistent presence can make a significant difference. Checking in regularly, expressing genuine concern and reinforcing the survivor's agency in their own healing process are meaningful ways to contribute to their well-being. To my fellow survivors, first of all, I love you and I'm so proud of you. This journey of resilience and healing, I want you to know that you're not alone. Your strength is immeasurable and the path ahead, though difficult, is faced with opportunities to grow and to renew yourself. Firstly, acknowledge the courage that it takes to embark on this journey. Healing is not a linear process and your progress, no matter how small, deserves celebration. Embrace self-compassion, recognizing that your worth extends far beyond the scars of your past. One practical step forward is to reach out for support. You don't have to face this journey alone. Connect with friends, family, or support groups who can provide emotional and practical assistance. Share your story when you feel ready, breaking the silence that shrouds survivors. Your voice is a powerful tool for change, and by speaking out, you contribute to dismantling the stigma which surrounds domestic abuse. Seeking professional help is another crucial aspect of your healing journey. Therapists, counselors, and support organizations are well equipped to provide guidance tailored to your experience. Utilize resources like counseling services, hotlines, and legal assistance, understanding that these resources exist to help empower you on your path to recovery. Creating a safety plan is another critical step in regaining control over your life. You can download my free safety planning guide by clicking the link in my link tree in the description box below. 
It offers practical strategies for ensuring your well being and that of your loved ones. These are strategies that I used myself when I left my abuser. A safety plan can include steps such as identifying safe spaces, establishing communication strategies, and connecting yourself with local shelters and support networks. In the resources that we've gathered for you, you'll discover a wealth of links carefully curated to support you. From crisis helplines to legal aid services, these tools are designed to offer assistance at every step. Remember, accessing these resources is an act of self-empowerment, a testament to your commitment to breaking free from the chains of your abuser. As you embark on this journey, Focus on rebuilding your sense of self and rediscovering your passions. Engage in activities that bring you joy and fulfillment, whether it's reconnecting with your hobbies or exploring new avenues. Surround yourself with positivity and individuals who uplift your soul. Your journey is unique, and the pace at which you heal is entirely your own. Embrace the process, honoring each step forward no matter how small. In the description of this video, you'll find a community of support waiting to walk alongside you. Take a moment to explore those resources and remember, your story is that of resilience, strength, and the unwavering belief that a brighter tomorrow exists. If you believe in the power of conversation, in dismantling the silence that shrouds domestic abuse, and in fostering empathy, then I invite you to be a part of the Memento Mori Stories community. Subscribe to our channel to stay engaged with thought-provoking stories, discussions, and creative expressions. Together, we can be a force for awareness, understanding, and healing. Your subscription is not just a click. It's a pledge to be a part of a movement which embraces the power of storytelling to bring about positive change. Remember, Every voice matters, and yours can be a catalyst for change. Subscribe, share, and let's continue down this path together. together. At the time of recording this script, I am not finished with the painting that you've been watching me work on. However, this Oni is for a friend of mine named Nao. She's a warrior, and she's a queen, and I love her to bits. So far, I've put about 40 hours of work into this painting and I'm anticipating another 10 to 12 to get it finished. It's nine by 12 inches and composed of watercolor and gouache paint, Posca pen, India ink, and multiple gilding foils on 300 GSM, 140 pound cold pressed block. While this painting will not be available for sale, my other original works are, and my books are currently open to custom commissioned paintings as well as digital graphic design. Additionally, I have an incredibly limited number of prints still available for purchase. These are 9 by 12 inches on archival quality cardstock, and they go for 35 Canadian dollars each or $50 for two. I ship for free across Canada, but I'm happy to ship globally for a nominal fee. I am looking forward to finding more serious clients for graphic design and branding this year, so if any of the above sounds interesting to you, please send an email to hello at stageleftproject.ca. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate, and never underestimate the impact of your voice. Remember, one day you will die. But for now, live well. Ciao for now. <laughs>